Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Radio Detectives. Today's program is brought to you in part by the financial support of our listeners. You can uh, become one of our ongoing Patreon supporters for as little as $2 per month. And I want to thank Carol Ann for becoming our latest Patreon supporter uh, at the Shamus level of $4 or more per month. Thank you so much for your support, Carol Ann. And you can join her over at patreon.greatdetectives.net. You can also become a one-time supporter over at support.greatdetectives.net or by using the Zelle app, uh, sending donation to box13 at greatdetectives.net or by mail to Adam Graham, P.O. Box 15913, Boise, Idaho, 83715. That's Adam Graham, P.O. Box 15913, Boise, Idaho, 83715. Our listener's choice countdown continues. Today we're going to bring you the number 18 series, and uh, this will be uh, Ellery Queen, which we played back during Season 6. Uh, on this episode, the original air date is March 27th of 1948. And this one is The Armchair Detective. Graham is transcribed. Ellery Queen. <laughs> the interest of a safer American home, a happier American community, a more united state. The American Broadcasting Company and its affiliated stations bring you Ellery Queen. I dedicate this program to the fight against crime. Not only crimes of violence and crimes of dishonesty, but also crimes of intolerance, discrimination, and bad citizenship. Crimes against America. American Broadcasting Company presents another case in the career of Ellery Queen, celebrated fighter of crime. As usual, Ellery invites you to match wits with him as he relates the mystery. And before revealing the solution, he gives you a chance to solve it. Tonight, Ellery's guest armchair detective, who will represent you home armchair detectives, is the popular Hollywood columnist, Miss Sheila Graham. And now, Ellery Queen, your host for the next half hour. Thank you, Paul Masterson. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You've heard me investigate crimes in just about every imaginable place. Well, our crime tonight took place in the strangest locale of all, right in my own radio program. I call it... The... Stop! Oh. Ellery, hold it, will you? What's the matter for? What is it? Ellery, you can't do this. You'll have to switch. Give us another case. Oh, why? Murder on the Queen show? Are you crazy? You'll scare the bejinkers out of people, Ellery. They'll think it's actually happening in this studio yes, during the broadcast. Very good point, Paul. Yes, very good. Ladies and gentlemen, I ask you to be sure and keep in mind throughout the next half hour that you're listening to a case from the past, a crime that occurred a long time ago. Satisfied, Paul? Thanks, Ellery. <laughs> it's a case I've always called the armchair detective. <laughs> Veteran Queen fans will recall that in the early days of our radio show, as today, I invited some well-known person to come to the studio and sit in the guest detective's armchair. Then, as now, it was usually fun. But on the night I had in mind, things didn't quite go in the usual way. That night, about 15 minutes before we were scheduled to go on the air... In the Everybody got the cuts? I think so. Still, how are we on time? We'll have to pick up 15 seconds, Ellery. Oh, sure. Go on, catch this little back again. All oh, right, coming then. Who is it tonight? Dr. Monty McCain. Who? You know, the college professor who has his own radio show. McCain's English. Oh, oh. Correct English, crusader. That's right. You better brush up my grammar. <laughs> After you, Nikki. Thanks, Jim. Dr. McKean, Ellery Queen in the box. <laughs> How do you do, sir? I'm almost afraid to answer, Dr. McKean. I might hang a participle or something. <laughs> so 
darling. Oh, Rosemary, I'm sorry. My dear, may I present Mr. Ellery Queen? How do you do, Mr. McKay? And uh, this character is my brother and business manager, Bud McKay. Oh, hello there. I uh, think our paths have crossed in radio parts. And a small business. Say, Ellery, seeing that we're pals, how about tipping Marty off for tonight's solution? Oh, huh? oh sorry. <laughs> Bud, we are rebuffed. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, uh, oh, yes, sorry, Elsie. Uh, my secretary, Miss Woolen. Miss oh, Woolen. This is really a thrill, Mr. Queen. I'm a... I'm a died in the wool queen fan. <laughs> oh, why isn't that nice? Thank you, Miss Woolen. Oh, Dr. McKinney, we haven't too much time. Shall we go into the guest detective room? Uh, Marty, to sit in a special room, Mr. Queen. Right in here, Mrs. McKing. Oh, oh yes, well, well, all right, right. isn't it? Yeah, See, we've yeah, tried to duplicate a whole mat. Yeah, oh, Nicky, would you pour me a glass of water, please? My throat. Oh, yeah. You know, you can't see the broadcast in this room. Oh, is that so? You just hear it. As you would in your own home. Program piped in here from the control room, Marty. You get it through that, that loud speaker. Oh, how cool. Oh, so I see, but... At the uh, proper time, Mr. Queen, I take it I extemporize in that microphone above the table? Yes, Doctor. Strictly an ad-lib spot. Immediately after my announcement on the air that I know who committed the crime, Nikki and I dash into this room from the studio, seat ourselves on the other side of the table from you, and then we hold a three-cornered post-mortem over the court. Not okay. Dr. McKean's corpse, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Elsie, do I detect an unconscious secretarial wish to achieve my destruction? <laughs> Marty, I don't find that a bit funny. Don't come, Rosemary. But, Mrs. McKing, I didn't. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, oh, no, no. <laughs> oh right, Nikki, yes. I should explain no one's allowed in this room but our guest of the evening. So, Nikki, if you'll show the rest of Dr. McKing's party to the client's booth. Oh, certainly. Oh, that's right. Right. I thought you were taking well, we have a good Now, if you get thirsty during the broadcast, Doctor, here's a picture of water right on the table. Oh, oh yes, thank you. Oh, Bill. Yes, Henry. How about a quick level? Whenever he's ready. Uh huh. Uh, if you'll be seated, Dr. McKean, if you want to say something into the mic, I'll it all. Just the voice level says. I left Dr. McKean alone in the armchair detective's room. We went on the air with our program, and in due course, I reached the point in our mystery where I was able to say. But, Ellery, do you mean to say? Yes, Dad. Now I know who committed the murder. Dr. McKing, a little nervous, but otherwise himself. I said into the table. And there, ladies and gentlemen, you have the mystery. Now, let's see what our guest, our kid detective, has to say. And tonight, ladies and gentlemen, our guest is the famous Dr. Monty McKing, founder and leading light of that popular radio program, McKing's English. All I can think of at this moment, Dr. McKing, is McQueen's ignorance. <laughs> <laughs> You're too modest, Emery. Eh? You're not the worst offender by any means. Oh, oh you're sometimes guilty of ellipses. Is that bad, Doctor? <laughs> but you usually avoid committing such truly foul crimes against our mother tongue as needless variants, irrelevant allusions, pleonasms, periphrases. Surrender. <laughs> <laughs> but to get away from the English language and how not to use it, Dr. McKing, I hear you're famous in a different sphere altogether. Yes. You're said to be able to whip up a mean booyah base, Doctor. Oh, yes, Nikki. I am an enthusiastic amateur chef. Doesn't your wife resent it? On the contrary, Nikki. Mrs. McKing is only too happy to leave the solution of our household's culinary mysteries to me. Ah, talking about solving mysteries, Dr. McKing. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> I find that drought has suddenly attacked my vocal cords. Simple, we'll irrigate them. Nikki, will you apply? I'm way ahead of you, here you are, Dr. McKinney. A nice, wet glass of water. Oiled. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Now, as soon as you're through oiling your larynx, Doctor, suppose you tell us who committed the murder in the police commissioner's office. <coughs> oh, what's the... Uh, don't let the uh, water glass worry you, Doctor. Who committed the... the mur- <coughs> oh, he's... You know to speak, eh, Dr. McKinney? <laughs> well, it happens to the best of us. In just a moment, I'll give the solution to tonight's mystery, but first... Nikki and I hurried around the table to Dr. McKing's chair. He 
fell off his chair, Doctor. Uh, Queen. Queen, I... I poisoned. Poisoned? By what, Dr. King? Uh, What's that? I search Rosemary. Uh, uh, Doctor. Search Rosemary? That's his wife. Dr. McKinney. Hillary, call a doctor. For what, Nicky? Hillary, what's going on in here? What's happened to your guest? Hey. Dead, Phil. Dead? But we're still on the air. The key to poison is in that glass of water McKinney just drank. Our water? From the pitcher? Pitcher's loaded with it, too. Smell this, Phil. Huh? Oh, what am I doing? Hillary, for the love of Mike, we're still on. You've got to finish the show. Solve the murder. Yes, solve the murder. Phil, have this room guarded until we're off the air. Nicky? Back to the mic. I don't know how we got through the rest of the program. My mind's a blank on the whole thing. But the minute we went off the air that evening, Ellery hurried back to the guest room to solve a very different kind of murder. The murder of his own armchair detective. No, no, no. I didn't, Inspector Queen. I didn't, I tell you. Mrs. McKinney, your husband's dying words were to search you. Well, you didn't find anything on me, did you? The idea of murder is ridiculous. Queen, my brother probably committed suicide. Impossible, bud. The poison that killed him comes only in liquid form, so it must have been in the container. And there's no poison container of any kind, either on Dr. McKinney's body or in this room. Inspector, Billy, I found it. Ah, the bottle's empty, Inspector, but smell it. Uh-huh. This is it, all right. Sergeant, where'd you find that bottle? On the floor of that glass enclosed booth where Miss McKay, Bud McKay, and Miss Woolen watched the broadcast once. Client's booth? Oh, Nicky, feeling better? Oh, yes, sir. Well, no one else is in that booth, Inspector. Just his wife, his brother, and his secretary. That ought to simplify it. All right. You sure the water in this picture was okay when the McKay party first came in here with you and Nicky? Before we went in the air? Positive, sir. Oh, Inspector, Ellery drank a glass full of it in circles. So one of these three dropped the poison into the picture before Miss Porter escorted him out. Afraid we forced the poisonous hand, Nicky, by sending him into that pool. Mrs. McKay, it looked as if your husband had noticed you fooling around with that pitcher. If Marty had seen me drop poison into the water, would he have drunk any of it? Rosemary's got a point there, Inspector. He probably didn't get the significance of what he'd seen until he realized he was poisoned. But when he does realize it, he says to search you for the bottle. But why should I murder Marty? I loved my husband. I loved him dearly. Life won't be the same. I'll say it won't. Miss Woolen. What do you say? What did you mean, Miss Waller? Yes, go on, Elsie. Say it. All right, I will. Dr. McKinney was the kindest husband in the world to her. And all she cared about was money. Money for clothes, furs, and jewelry. When he had to close down her charge account, she... She poisoned him. Out of revenge. How much, Waller? No, for his estate. His will leaves everything to her. That's why Mrs. McKinney poisoned him. For his money. Well, Mrs. McKay? What can I say, Mr. Cree, Your Eminence? I've already told you that a dozen times. True, I've been extravagant, and I was angry when Marty clamped down on me, but commit murder for money? The man I loved? All right. Come out with me a minute. Oh, yes, Dad. Shut the door. Well, shut it. It's shut, Dad. Oh. He's playing radio door. What do you think, son? I don't know. The king did put the finger on his wife. Well, may have been no more than a stab in the dark, Dad. Certainly not enough to hold her on. I think I'll send her home. Have Feely come through the house on the QT. Might send Nicky home with her, too. Good idea, Dad. She could snoop out information where they wouldn't give out the time of day. Blast it. Sure, but what? Well, Dad, ever since McKing said search Rosemary, I've had the weirdest feeling that... That he meant something else? I don't know. I had the feeling there's a clue... A clue I've missed or forgotten. A clue that ties in with McKing's dying words. Maybe something that happened during the... Of course. You got it? No, Dad. No, but I know where I can get it. Talk. Ain't that. Well, they always make recordings for the Queen shows, Dad. Now, you go ahead with your plans. I'm going to take a recording of tonight's show home and play it back. All night, if necessary. The spot that... Whatever it is. <laughs> Somewhere. Money. 
honest, Emery. You're not the worst offender by any means. Oh, oh you're sometimes guilty of a little. Oh, it can't be there. Various, irrelevant allusions, pleonasm. Yeah. Said to be able to whip up a mean boy of age, Doctor. Oh, yes, Nicky. I am an enthusiastic amateur chef. Doesn't your wife... What about chef? On the contrary, Nicky. Chef. Mrs. McKean. Chef. Can it be that... Amateur chef. Doesn't your wife... That's it. Nikki, honey. The 
closer. Oh, she's okay, Maestro. I am not, Sergeant. Why, you... Oh, Peggy, what were you doing? Snoopy. Why? Well, I heard someone going berserk in some room downstairs. Really? By the time Nikki got out into the upstairs hall, it was all over. She bumped into the... Whoever it was, in the dark, he grabbed her. Downstairs, the kitchen, wasn't it? How'd you know? I want to see it. Which way? Come on. Nikki, wait for me! Hurry up, Nikki! I wouldn't care if I dropped dead right in this spot, Ellery. Probably too late. I should have foreseen that the killer would have... What are you talking about, Ellery? Here gets me half killed. Here's the kitchen, Marjorie. And then he won't even wait. Well, for the... Look at this place. A wreck. Dishes broken, furniture knocked over his... search or something. But why? Then why in the kitchen? Remember Dr. McKing's dying words? Search Rosemary. Meaning his wife. Not necessarily. Not his wife? But Ellery, Rosemary. That's Mrs. McKing's first name. Son. It's also the name of something else. Dr. McKing was an amateur chef. An enthusiastic cook. And this ought to be the spice cabinet. Spice cabinet. Just that clack of the head, anyway. Old clothes, thyme, mace, marjoram, sage, basil, nutmeg, old ginger. Ah, look. Rosemary. Huh? Rosemary. And her abuse in cooking. He said search Rosemary meant to finish a sentence. Or search Rosemary jar in spice cabinet or something like that. Search Rosemary jar? Well, I will search it. I'm right. There'll be something in this jar. Unless the searcher beat us to it. He missed it. There is. A wad of typewriter paper. Message the king left it. What's it say, Ellery? Oh, dated ten days ago. Due to a recent disturbing episode, I am writing this note as a precaution. If anyone finds it, I'm the only one who uses the spice cabinet to it will be because they are investigating my murder. The other night, a certain person close to me threatened my life. Hey, I, I was inclined to at first dismiss it as hysteria. Now I am not so sure. If anything happens to me, the person who threatened to kill me was... Who, oh, Ellery? Come on, maestro. Elsie Woolen, my secretary. Signed, Marty McKing. Really? Get that woolen girl down here. Miss Sheila Graham. Good evening, Miss Graham. And uh, 
Welcome to the armchair. Thank you, but uh, after listening to your mystery tonight, I'm a little worried about occupying this post. Oh, <laughs> you have nothing <laughs> to be afraid of. Uh, perhaps you'd like a glass of water to help you relax. Heavens, no! <laughs> well, that's the last thing in the world I'd want. Well, I can't say that I blame you. But now suppose we get down to business. Tell me, who do you think is the criminal in tonight's story? Well, it's very complicated tonight. Oh, sure. But I think Miss Woolen, the secretary, did it. I see. And uh, you... See, it, uh, well, it was a very subtle murder. It takes a smart girl to murder a man like that and took a lot of preparation. Secretaries yes. are usually rather smart, and, and she knew this man. And she knew that... that he might get thirsty. He obviously got thirsty very often in his office. And also, he said that somebody uh, very hysterically threatened his life yes. previously. You mean in the note he left? Yes, for in the him. note he left. Mm -hmm. And she was a very hysterical woman, so I think Miss Woolen did it. Thank oh, you very much, Miss Sheila Graham. We'll find out in just a moment if your solution is correct. Now, here is Paul Masterson. A second great war has in the not-too-distant past drawn to a close. The magnificent, self-sacrificing work of the International Red Cross will long be remembered. At home, the American Red Cross has always been on the job whenever disaster struck, whether it was a tornado, earthquake, fire, or flood. It is our duty and our privilege to help make the 1948 Red Cross campaign the best ever. The quota is set at $75 million. By giving to the Red Cross... You are giving directly to your relatives and friends and the armed forces and here at home. Let's make 1948 the banner year in donations to the American Red Cross. I don't care. I don't want to hear it. He's just too, too smart. Always knows the answer to mysteries. Well, I want to hear it. Mickey, five down. What have you got, Elvie? Swelled head. Thank <laughs> you. Oh, it's all right, Dad. It's that crack on the skull. Well, now, what was Dr. Monty McKing's profession? What was he most famous for? His radio program. McKing's English. He's authority on the correct usage of the English language. Then let's take another look at that note we just found in the Rosemary Jar. I quote, Due to a recent disturbing episode, I am writing and so forth. Uh, something wrong there, Maestro? Oh, Sergeant. You, too, in that sentence is hopelessly incorrect. Oh, it is, huh? It should read, because of a recent disturbance. I am writing so forth. You, too, can never be used adverbially. Is that so? And this. If anyone finds it, it'll be because they are investigating my murder. Anyone must be followed by he. One can't possibly mean the plural. Oh, uh, Miss Porter is with us again. Yes, Nick. Another mistake. And this. I was inclined to at first dismiss... A split in Fenitin. A split in what? In other words, this short note, purportedly from the pen of an authority on correct English, reveals not one, not two, but three of the commonest errors of usage. Incredible. Conclusion, Dr. McKing did not write the note. It's a phony. Uh, I mean a forgery. And since the note was not written by Dr. McKing, it was not left in the Rosemary jar by Dr. McKing either. Someone else left the note in the jar, obviously the real writer of the note, the forger. Tell why? What was accomplished by it? Well, a great deal, then. It made us believe that the word rosemary in Dr. McKing's dying statement, search rosemary, meant rosemary the herb rather than rosemary the name of a woman. And who gains by our thinking that the victim was not accusing a woman named rosemary, but was merely telling us to look for a note in a spice jar? Only rosemary McKing herself. She did poison her husband. Tried to twist his accusation of her to mean something entirely different. So she had a guilty conscience. So tonight, after I put her to bed, she forged her husband's signature to a note accusing Elsie Woolen, then sneaked downstairs, left the note in the rosemary jar as a blind... And then Nicky deliberately led us to that jar. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Led us to the jar, my stroke? Well, by wrecking the kitchen, Sergeant. What was that but a clever device to draw our attention to it? To make us search it and find her plant in the rosemary jar. On her way back upstairs, she bumped into me in the dark and let me have it. But... Uh, 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 uh. At that, Rosemary's attempt to lead us down a false trail might have succeeded. If only she'd learned from her victim the rules governing the English language. Well, here's where she learned something about the rules governing murder. Really? Oh, Rosemary McKing? For the murder of, of my armchair detective. <laughs> uh, oh. Yes, sir. Ladies and 
gentlemen, you have the solution to our mystery. Thank you again, Miss Sheila Graham, for serving as our guest armchair detective this evening. As mementos of the occasion, I have for you a copy of my latest mystery anthology, The Queen's Awards, 1947, and a subscription to Ellery Queen's Mystery Magazine. Ah, Paul. Feeling all right? Well, I guess we're okay. There have been no calls yet asking if our armchair detective's really been knocked off. <laughs> and what are you worried about? Among other things, Ellery, next week. And never mind about next week. What's the matter, Nikki? What gives next week that it darkens the fair brow and brings lightning into those beauteous orbs? Why, Paul. <laughs> well, it's nothing, Nikki. I, I guess you bring out the poet in me. Paul. Nikki. Remember me? Go away. Uh, not you, Nikki. Yes, I remember you, Ellery Q. I remember that female, too. <laughs> what female? Oh, Nikki's referring to next week's problem. I'll say she was a problem. Uh, what was her... Uh, I mean, its name, Ellery. Well, you were right the first time, Paul. I call her... Uh, I mean, it. The Farmer's Daughter. <laughs> this is Ellery Queen saying good night until next week and enlisting all Americans every night and every day in the fight against bad citizenship, bigotry, and discrimination, the crimes which are weakening America. All names used on this program are fictitious and do not refer to real people, either living or dead. Among the members of tonight's cast were Larry Dobkin, Herb Butterfield, Kay Brinker, Alan Reed, Joan Banks, Bill Johnston, Charles Seal, Ann Morrison, and Joe Kern. Music was by Rex Corey, direction by Dick Woolen, entire production under the supervision of Ellery Queen. Now, a listening reminder. For a hilarious combination of spring fever and spring house cleaning, listen when Willie Piper's spring fever combats his wife's feverish energy on Tales of Willie Piper tonight. The preceding program came to you by transcription. The best time to plan for the future of your children is when they're small. That's the time to set up a nest egg for their education. And your banker will tell you that the best way to do it is to put the money... Welcome back. Well, I wish that Ellery Queen's retention uh, policy for radio programs was uh, the same as uh, in this radio program, given that most old-time radio programs had a policy of getting rid of uh, old transcription desk. If Ellery Queen had actually saved each episode, uh, well, we wouldn't have uh, uh, less than 20 episodes of the series throughout its uh, more than 300 episode run. And this is definitely a series that I really uh, would love to hear more of. I enjoyed this one, uh, particularly just for the armchair detective focus. I decided to play this as I think it's probably one of the most uh, meta radio programs, just with, you know, all of the stuff that's going on with uh, this being a situation where uh, Ellery is actually working on recording his own program. And having a story where he has to solve the murder of the armchair detective. This feature is really good, and it's, to me, it's really integral to the whole Ellery Queen experience, just with uh, doing the shows as they're written. Uh, in fact, for those episodes that were missing uh, their uh, segment, when we uh, played the er Ellery Queen series, I actually... I got some of our uh, listeners to uh, play the armchair detectives. It's a really unique and fun aspect of this particular program. All right, listener comments and feedback now. Tam writes regarding uh, Pete Kelly's Blues, which uh, was number five on the short division list. Uh, I had forgotten how much I enjoyed Pete Kelly's Blues. Thanks for reminding me. Well, thank you, uh, Tim, and that's one of the uh, outcomes that I hope for with the Listener's Choice Countdown of people being able to hear and remember some favorites that we haven't played for a while. Now I'd like to thank our Patreon of the day. Thank you so much to Larry, who has been one of our Patreon supporters since September 2016, uh, currently supporting us at the 
a master detective level of $15 or more per month. Thanks once again for your support, Larry. All right, that will do it for today. Join us back here tomorrow for Stand By for Crime. Next Monday, your listener's choice countdown continues with number 17 in the standard division. And then next Tuesday, we'll see the return of a uh, series we've previously uh, played with a new episode, and that will be Dr. Tam Detective. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.